morning, everyone. Like Dawn mentioned, we are in uh, part four. Today, we're going to be looking at speaking and boasting. But before we get started, I just want to say that this word today has the potential to change your life. You know, maybe you find yourself lo looking at your own life, wondering the direction that it has gone, or maybe there's some stuff that you're having to deal with and you're not, not quite understanding why you're actually going through, through, through it or dealing with it. And I trust this morning that this word is going to really open up our eyes to, to just how powerful words spoken are and how they actually impact and, and, and can shape one's life. So like I mentioned, it is speaking and boasting words are incredibly powerful and carry in them both life and death words so innocent and powerless as they are as standing in a dictionary how potent and evil they become when someone who knows how to combine them yes words can be evil and can be destructive. And I'm pretty sure all of us sitting here today, at some time or other in our life, have experienced this of words being evil and destructive. Maybe we've experienced it in our personal life. Maybe words that have been spoken of years ago that have not been good are still impacting us today. But words are also life-giving, creative, encouraging, and wonderful. Think for a moment about a time when, we, when someone spoke an encouraging and life-giving word over you. Think about how it made you feel. Think about even now as you think about it, how it even makes you feel today. So words can also be encouraging, they can be creative, they can be wonderful when they're spoken over us and used in the correct manner. In fact, we see this example of words being life-giving and creative, and we see word in power in Genesis chapter 1, where God literally spoke life into existence. He spoke the world into existence. If we just take a second to think about the words that we speak in in our lives, what are they speaking into existence in our current situations, in our circumstances, and even the stuff that we're going through and asking the Lord, what are the words that we are using in our sphere of influence and over ourselves? Close to a third of the book of James is devoted to the words we speak, how we speak them, and why we speak them. So the main teaching today is out of James chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 1 and 2. I have four points this morning, and the... Let, let me not get there. Let me just read the scripture first. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say have their whole body in check. So like I mentioned, I've got four points, and the big point number one is that we all stumble. James begins this section by making a point about the judgment of teachers and preachers will occur because of their position that they hold. This statement from James wouldn't make much sense if it was not connected to the rest of the chapter because as we unpack the chapter today, we will see just how powerful words can be in our lives, spoken over others, and just how they just impact everything that we actually do. And like I mentioned before, I pray that this message today is just going to highlight stuff in our lives that can literally change the trajectory of our own life and that in Jesus we are able to be free from anything and any, anything that people have spoken over us or that we might even believe about ourselves by words that have been spoken. Just getting back to teachers, after all, teachers and preachers, words are the primary medium through which teachers teach and preachers preach. Maybe James is trying to acknowledge just how serious the situation is by revealing the weight of the responsibility that he was carrying and that 
the teachers actually carry in the church. James had identified two things that were happening. So the first thing is James found that this department of church work had become extremely popular. And then the second thing was it was far too easy to take the position of teaching lightly in the church without considering its costs in terms of accountability. So clearly something is taking place in the church that James has become aware of. Maybe the words were spoken where behind the word there was no responsibility or accountability. There was just words spoken. James remind us, reminds us that being among the teachers in God's church is more than a matter of having natural or spiritual giftings. But there's a dimension to having the right character. So clearly we can see that James is highlighting this stuff because he has obviously seen something that is taking place that concerns him about the church and that he wants to, to, to highlight this in this letter to us just about how important our words are and how much power they actually carry and how important it is for the accountability and responsibility to be behind them. But James immediately goes into verse 2 when he says, we all stumble in many ways. Interestingly, right here, James is including himself when he says, we all stumble. Friends, the big point out of this is James is not making excuses for himself or for us, but what he is doing and what he is saying to us, that we need to come out and find ourselves in the path with our relationship with God, led by the Spirit, and as we walk closer with the Lord, we will stumble less. So the Greek word translated stumble does not apply to a fatal fall. But something that trips us up hinders our spiritual growth and of those around us. Our words spoken can influence other people. The word spoken to us that we hear can influence us as well. But James continues in verse 2 when he says, anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. So James is communi uh, communicating something to us here in verse 2. And there's three things I want to pull out of verse 2. First, he is saying, if we are able to control our mouth, we can control anything. He goes on, the second point I want to pull out here, when we reach the end or when we reach this place in the journey, we have reached perfection about controlling our mouth. But the third thing, which is very interesting, that James is also providing a way for teachers and all believers to measure spiritual maturity. When he said, if anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man. To not stumble in word, friends, shows spiritual maturity. But we stumble in words about ourselves with our boasting, selective reporting. We stumble in words about others with our criticism, gossip, slander, cruelty, anger. Even with our flattery and insincere words, meant for gain. Our words spoken out of our words spoken are out of the revelation of our inner character. In Matthew 12 verse 34, Jesus says, "Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks." Going into point number two this morning, the power of the tongue. We remain in chapter 3, it's three uh, verses 3 to 5, and it says, When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants it to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. 
Here, friends, James is giving us three practical examples how something large and powerful can be controlled by a tiny object. A horse's bit, the rudder of a ship, even a small fire are all used to make a very big point for us this morning. But I want to stop right there. In Christ, there's no condemnation for those in Christ. So if something, please don't sit here feeling, oh my word, I said this and that this week and you know, feel condemned. Friends, this is a message of conviction. So if we find ourselves in this place, just it's, it's an indication that we just need to draw closer to Jesus, to the Holy Spirit. I'm going to be very vulnerable. Yesterday, I had my notes in my hand and I'm not going to mention the person, but someone asked me something and I did not respond in a manner that how I should have responded. And I had the very notes in my hand and I'm like, oh Lord, I've done it again. But there was conviction. I repented, friends. And and it just reminded me, it, it revealed to me how important our relationship with the Holy Spirit is to have Jesus in our life. So please don't sit here feeling, oh my gosh, I'm dropping the ball. Rather sit here and say, I need to press more into Jesus. I need to find out what this wonderful relationship that God has for me, because from that relationship, everything starts to change. And God's got a sense of humor. I'm like holding my notes in my hand. He says, see, Ryan, you need to press into me more. All these things are ultimately under the control or will of something else. A small bit in the mouth controls a strong horse. A small rudder turns a large ship. So when we have control over our tongue and our words that we speak, it is an indication that we have control over ourselves. So I didn't show much control yesterday, but I apologize, I repented, and I said, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that your grace and love is sufficient. I thank you that you accept me. I thank you, Lord, that you're revealing to me just how much more I actually need to press into you. And it's not to feel bad. It's just to be built up and, and, and just be the son that God's called me to, to, as well as you guys being the sons and daughters that God has called you to be, and even to you guys that are online this morning. The bits and the rudder are small but extremely important. If they are not controlled... The entire hus would be out of control. If they are not, if the ship is not in control of the rudder, then the whole ship would be out of control. It is possible for something as small as the tongue is to have tremendous power for either good or for evil. So it leaves us with this question this morning. If the tongue is like a bit in the mouth of a horse or a rudder on the ship, who or what has the reins? Who or what is directing the rudder? It's a very good question that we are able to ask ourselves this morning. And I ask myself often, it's always, Lord, just reveal the thing so that, you know why? Because we want to be used by God. We want to find out this amazing life that God has for us. And it's even these kind of things in our lives that we need to address with the Lord and allow Him to work it out with us and say, Lord, I'm here to learn. Lord, I'm here to to be found in Your presence as we build our relationship with Jesus. It is good it is a good reminder that we do have a role to play in all of this. We have responsibility over our words. We have responsibility over our tongue and the choice to use them for profit or for destruction in the kingdom. Are we using our words as building blocks into people's lives and into the kingdom? Or or, 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 are our words the bulldozer that is breaking down the words. Sometimes our words are are, are breaking down words of faith from other people that they've invested into other people's lives. We just want to always continue to press people towards Jesus and, and show them Jesus, even in our words that we speak. So what is the potential for disaster here? Why is James making such a big deal about this? For us today. So we find this answer in verse 
6, it says, The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself on fire by hell. Doesn't sound good, but think about all the ways the tongue is being described by James this morning for us. He describes it as a fire, a world of unrighteousness, staining the whole body. This one member can stain and pollute all members of the body, setting on fire the entire course of life. And I'm just going to read this out. This is better translated as the circle of life, which shows the tongue's ability to spread evil beyond just the individual and literally to everything in its sphere of influence. And then set on fire by hell. The tongue has the unique potential to unleash hell on others. You know, we all, and I've been, I've told my children this, you know, children are told sticks and stones may break our bones, but words will never hurt me. We've all told our children that. I was told that growing up, but that isn't true. The bitter pain of words spoken over our lives can last a lifetime, long after the broken bone has healed. So our our words carry a lot of power into other people's lives, but also into our own lives. What others say to us and what we say to others can last a long time. The casual, sarcastic or critical remark can inflict a lasting injury on another person. We can change the trajectory of another person's life simply by what we say to them. That's the power of the word that we have. The point James is trying to uh, is trying to make is getting clearer and clearer for us that no human has been able to tame the tongue, which brings us into point number three. It says the difficulty of taming the tongue, and James shares this view for us in verses seven and eight. <clears throat> he says, All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. In fact, with it we bless our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and we curse people who are made in the image of God. And in verse 10, which is not here, James says this shouldn't be. And the big question is why? When we curse others and then sing praises out of the same mouth, it sends the wrong message. It leaves the wrong impression of who God is. And when we go look at in, in scriptures, as much as that we want to grow in favor with God, it also says as we grow in favor with God, we shall grow in favor with man. So we have got a big part to play when it comes to seeing other people coming into the kingdom of God. And often our words that we share can be the difference. The human spirit has incredible capacity for sacrifice and self-control. You know, have you ever heard of those wonderful survival stories? I know I watched a movie a few years ago where a guy was, I can't remember the full story, but he's out rock climbing, he loses his foot and he falls down a canyon and he finds himself with his arm trapped between two boulders and now he is literally fighting for his life fighting for survival, he's on his own, there's no way out, and he comes to this desperate place where he decides that the only thing he can do in order to escape is sacrifice his arm by cutting it off, in order that he can get out of the canyon, get to hospital, it's a true story, you can go find it on Netflix, I can't remember, the, he's a well-known actor that plays the part, and to get to hospital, to get safe, to get to, you know, to survive, Yet that same man can't tame the tongue perfectly. But friends, like I mentioned earlier, even though it sounds like it's doom and gloom and where do we go from here, 
we have an antidote. Again, I just want to reiterate this, is that there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ. It's conviction. The Holy Spirit is just drawing us into a closer relationship and saying, come and find me, and we will outwork this lovely life that we have together where all the benefits of the fruits of the Spirit, kindness, joy, peace, are just abundantly available for us to walk out and outwork our life. So the tongue can be brought under the power and control of the Holy Spirit. So big point number four, which is our last point of the morning, it says we have been given the antidote. James chapter 3 verse 13, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good deed, by their good life, and by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. So I just want to focus in on that word humility. Humility means believing what God says about you over everyone else's opinion, including your own opinion about yourself. It requires embracing who you are in Christ over who you are in the flesh. So we've got to believe who, what Christ says about us not what we feel on a daily basis about ourselves. We've got to believe what he says. To be biblically humble is to be so free of concern for your own ego that you elevate those around you. And then staying in the same scripture, just a different translation, it says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his work in the meekness of of wisdom. And I just want to bring our attention for a minute to this word meekness. Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. You can read that in Matthew 5, verse 5. The word meek from the original language was used in describing reigning in a stallion. It is the idea of a horse being controlled by a bit, which we have been speaking about already this morning. The hus is choosing to submit to authority. That is meekness, friends. It is power under constraint. Meekness is not weakness. And we need, to, we need to understand that. In today's world, we've lost the understanding of meekness because of the world we live in. Because meekness is, is completely counterculture to the world we live in. It's like fight where meekness is submissive. It's gentle, it's, it's, it's not uh, argumentative, or let me just carry on. Meekness is not weakness, it is power under control. Meekness is essentially an attitude or quality of the heart whereby a person is willing to accept and submit without resistance to the will and desire of someone. For us who believe, the sons and daughters of God, that is God himself. And you can understand just by what meekness means, why it maybe it's been lost in the believer today. And it's actually a fruit of the Spirit. But because we live in such a, 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 a hard world, we, we tend not to even go there because we've got to almost like, you know, stand up for ourselves all the time where, where, where the Word is saying something completely different, that we can be meek and we will inherit the earth. So the antidote James is talking about is the Holy Spirit, is being led by the Holy Spirit into humility, meekness, and kindness. Furthermore, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. So we don't let our words exalt us before people and life, but we allow him as we humble ourselves under his rule, under his reign of our Lord Jesus, as under his grace under his mercy, under his love, under his kindness, under his meekness, we find ourselves under him, and at the proper time, he will exalt us. Isn't it true that so many of us, so many of our arguments stem from a place where we want something, where we have a hole that needs to be filled? I put my hand up, I've been there lots of times. Maybe we want to be seen as smart or funny or wise. Maybe it's to be wealthy and powerful or healthy and free-spirited. And I'm sure we all know a lot of those free-spirited people. Whatever it may be, and I'm going to read this out. 
We often use our words to try and accomplish for ourselves what we never would be able to on our own. So we use our words to evaluate, to exalt who we, who we want to be rather than who we actually are in Christ and finding ourselves just being humble and submissive to him and obedient to his word rather than trying to be obedient to the word we want in our lives to say who we are. We're all sons and daughters of the Most High God. He loves us. He cares about us. He cares about every need that you have in your life, even if you don't think so. He cares about where you are right now in your life and what you're going through and experiencing. And he wants you to turn your eyes to him. He wants to help you walk out your walk with him. He really, really does. But that's not how the world operates. That's why it's so important. The scripture says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of your faith. Turn your eyes off the, 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 the natural things that are happening. Lift your eyes to heaven. Let me throw you the balls that I want you to throw. You catch the balls I want. Don't worry about all the other stuff that's going around. Just seek me. Find me out. See who I am. We desire wholeness, peace, and contentment, friends, which only comes from Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. In order to, to experience this wholeness, peace, and contentment, we have to be born again. We need to be led by the Spirit of God in our lives. Yet somehow, ironically, we cause so much destruction in our pursuit of trying to find wholeness, trying to find peace and contentment by the words we speak out, the words we speak out over others, maybe the words, I think the main, the whole main idea of this is the words that we actually speak over ourselves and what we believe of ourselves. And then the word comes. Out of, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We need to start evalu- uh, 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 exalting Jesus in our lives and Trust in his word and what his word says about who we are. Knowing scripture, declare scripture over you. When you feel down and out, declare the scriptures over your life. If we're born again, every word in the, in, in the scriptures is for you and I, and we can declare them over our lives. We can bring life into our lives and those around us. James 4 says, Do not speak evil against one another. There's only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and destroy. And I want to touch on this. God is the only true judge of thoughts, motives, and intentions of others. When we speak evil of or slander other, another person, we aren't speaking kingdom life into them. So we're not building them up. The very words that Jesus built us up with, because it's all in the scripture, he wants us to build others up with. And I would just like to touch on kindness, because it is part of the antidote and fruit of the Spirit. Kindness is selfless, compassionate, and merciful. Its greatest power is revealed in practice to our enemies. Isn't that amazing? For a perfect emblem of biblical kindness, we need to not look any further than that of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. The fruit of kindness is the Christ-like characteristic of behaving towards others as God has unto us. Every single person. Even when we feel that they don't deserve it. Because it's the kindness of God that leads a person to repentance and his gentleness. Even born-again believers, there's things in our house that we need to repent about. So our kindness can lead people to go deeper with Jesus. When we struggle to be nice, and it does happen, I'll put my hand up, we just need to remember that, the, that kindness is something that God loves to bestow upon his people. It is a gift that God gives to his people. The born-again believer, it is in the fruits of the Spirit, kindness. So it's not all doom and gloom. We have the power of the Holy Spirit to control anything and everything in our life when there's a submission and we fall under him and we trust him and believe him. So many times we fight for things. I'm always reminded of Jesus is when they hurled insults on him. They spat on him. They beat him. The scriptures, I think it's also in James, it says he did, he did not retaliate. So he did not retaliate with word or with action. He entrusted himself to the one who judges judges. Justly, which is God. 
That's meekness in display for us. The demonstration of a living faith is in controlling what we say. Why don't we stand as we end off this morning? Emily Dixon said, A word is dead when it is said, some say. I say it just begins to live that day. Again, friends, our words are incredibly powerful and carry in them both life and death. Let's encourage someone this week and point them to Jesus. Let's have, do you want to share them? Let's encourage them this week and point them to Jesus. Let's be graceful and loving. Let our words be seasoned with grace, seasoned with love as we experience the Lord Jesus and as we allow those around us to experience Jesus with us. With us. So I just want to pray for you this morning. Father, we just want to give you all the praise and honor, Lord. We lift your name on high, Father God. We lift your name on high this morning. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your grace. We thank you for your mercies. We thank you for your love. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that you teach us your way every single day when we open our hearts to it, Lord Jesus. Lord, please transform our words into messages of hope and reconciliation. Help us resist the temptation to speak evil of others and instead give us the strength to share the hope of Jesus with everyone that we come into contact with this week and going forward. Lord, we pray that there's, and we thank you that there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ, Lord, but this is a message to draw us closer to you, that you are available all the time for us to press in and learn from and walk with. We thank you for every single promise that is in this word, Father God, the promises that are over our lives that are yes and amen, Father God. We come against every single lie of the enemy that has spoken over anyone here today and to those that are online. We break it, we bind it up in the mighty name of Jesus, and we say freedom to every single person that is here today. In your name we said, Amen.